Welcome to Imperfect Progress. I'm your host, Ann Guzman. When you drop in to listen here, you can expect to hear valuable conversations with interesting people about sport, sport physiology, nutrition, and navigating change in life. I hope these conversations navigating change in life. I hope these conversations resonate with you. I hope they inspire you and even challenge your perspectives on particular topics. I, for one, am a super curious person and I always look forward to learning from my guests and sharing that with you. I really love today's conversation with author, jur- author, journalist, and entrepreneur Molly Herford, where we talk about getting young girls involved in sport and what some of the barriers are and how, as a community, we can work to be more inclusive and why getting more female coaches is an important part of increasing girls' participation in sport. This topic needs a lot of airtime and a lot of action. We talk about Molly's books and why she wrote them, which was a really interesting twist that I didn't expect and I loved learning about it because it gave me a lot more insight into Molly's journey as an endurance athlete and as a person. So I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Thank you so much for listening and I'll see you inside the podcast. Okay, I'm excited to speak with Molly Herford today. And Molly's an entrepreneur who really seems to love the dynamic entrepreneur, who really seems to love the dynamic aspect of entrepreneurship as she's got a lot of things going on. She's a journalist, and if you've likely read one of her articles in either bicycling.com or mapmyride.com or another amazing outdoor-related magazine, Molly's also the I'll clarify that. Uh, with two of her books focused on young females in sport, which is something that I'm super interested to focus on today and get a better understanding of where Molly's drive comes from as far as getting and keeping more young females active. Molly also runs an amazing podcast with her husband now, which is absolutely amazing and a huge feat as I've recently learned how much work goes into it. <laughs> interesting conversations. So I'm super excited to have you here, Molly, and talk about women in sports today. So thanks for coming on. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. I was so excited to get you on the consummate athlete. Conversations. So I'm super excited to have you here, Molly, and talk about women in sports today. So thanks for coming on. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. I was so excited to get you on the consummate athlete. So this is this is really exciting to get to kind of flip the flip the script and talk about a very different topic this time. Yeah, for sure. And it's flip the flip the script and talk about a very different topic this time. Yeah, for sure. And it's cool because I'm typically like all sciencey, but I I really love this aspect of of sport as well because the science is interesting for sure, but what about like this early part of life and prevention of a lot of I think this is super exciting. Um I was always a young athlete myself or active. So to me, I I can really connect with the topic. And I love what you're doing, like just inspiring young young female athletes to get moving. You're actually out there with them. Uh, Two of your books. Congrats, by the way, on Ali's Ride. ride. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, very cool. And Shred Girls, which I am going to buy both of and I haven't yet, but my daughter um, loves the bike, which which is always cool. And I think those books will be amazing. Um, But before we dive into the books in particular, I actually want to ask you if you, particular, I actually want to ask you if you could give us some background about you as a young female and were you an athlete and did you grow up around sport and is that part of the motivation for writing these books? Yeah, it's it's such a good question because if you you know look at what I'm doing now, you would kind of make a course that makes perfect sense. Um, but the reality is that the, the story I always tell is my mom once tried to take me to T-ball when I was like five years old and I sobbed on the field until she had to come back and take me home. Um, I was the least athletic kid that you could possibly imagine. I, I faked fainting to get out of running the mile in gym class. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was picked last for every gym team, um, and I was very proud of that fact. That was not like, a, oh, poor me. I was completely okay with it. Um, I got banned from reading at recess because I wasn't playing enough. A super athletic kid, 
but oh, this uh, is super interesting. I love this aspect. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, to be to be honest, I didn't really get into sport till I was around nineteen. I guess, like probably end of my freshman year of college. I just, you know, kind of hit that that wall that young women will where and will where your body can handle a lot of stuff in its its younger years if you have decent genetics, which I was lucky enough to have. I'm naturally a super muscular, uh, you know short little person. So I managed to uh, <laughs> stay in reasonable shape. But then, you know, you hit 19 and you're eating at a dining hall and you're drinking, stay in reasonable shape. But then, you know, you hit 19 and you're eating at a dining hall and you're drinking, if you're me, a lot of Mountain Dew, um, eating a lot of pastries. And I was, mm-hmm. uh, I, I always say like, I was never an athlete, but I was always a writer. Like from when I was two years old, I knew I was going to be a writer when I grew up. <laughs> Um, That's awesome. So when I went to school, I was actually, even my freshman year, I was already working for, um, at the time, L Girl Magazine, which is the teen version of L. And I was sort of writing about their more like counterculture topics. So I was talking about how knitting related to feminism and how like uh, these homemade magazine zines were making, you know, kind of writing their their counterculture content, if you will. Um, So I was doing that full time and taking classes full time. And I'd be, you know, taking the train into New York and eating pizza, uh, like a Pizza Hut personal pan pizza for dinner every nice. single night. Um, yeah, super embarrassing. Uh, and I was really absolute crap. And I don't know why, but I was just like, okay, this is it. I'm going to get in shape. I think it was because I didn't actually want to give up the pizza or the Mountain Dew at that point. So I was like, okay, <laughs> I can tackle one of these sides, but it's not going to be giving up Mountain Dew. What can I do instead? Yeah. And I was like, all right. My dad was a triathlete back in the 80s. I remember he was on a stationary trainer in our uh, laundry room growing up, and I never really saw him ride it, but it was always there, and I would like try to climb on it and stuff. Um, <laughs> so he did that, and I was like, okay, I'm going to do a triathlon. And uh, yeah, luckily, my, my RA in my freshman year of college happened to be really into, uh, into triathlon, so yeah, I guess I'm going to do this. And then I eventually found my Rutgers cycling team, and they got me into bikes. And all I could think when I started racing cyclocross was, why the heck was I not doing this years and years ago? <laughs> So that is awesome. Wow. I love this story. This is such an amazing story. And I mean, I've, it's so great because story. And I mean, I've, it's so great because, you know, you're right. You, I didn't know what, you know, for sure the answer would be because I hadn't read about, um, you know, your life when you were young yet. So I wasn't, I was actually thinking maybe, maybe she wrote these books because she, didn't have that so I'm really curious now like hearing this didn't have that so I'm really curious now like hearing this story which I think is totally awesome and authentic like I absolutely adore it what like do you look back to being a kid and think oh I wish I had had that sporting community or is it just like oh this is a really cool community if as a kid was cool in its own ways because I was reading and doing all of those things and everything just happened at the time that it should definitely a little bit of both um you know I I wouldn't change a lot because I'm actually so grateful to my parents for not shoving me at sport um right. because I I wasn't super interested in it and they they let me awesome um mm-hmm. but that said the uh the sort of impetus for for writing the shred girls series was that you know looking back I'm like oh of course I wish I'd started riding bikes earlier I mean you know this when you start mountain biking in your mid-20s it's a yeah. lot harder to learn the skills than it is to learn them as like an 11 year old so oh yeah I'd been on the bike a little bit earlier than that um yeah okay totally interesting insight and yeah I agree fully about the age thing because I didn't buy my first bike till I was 27 yeah so so you know know. (laughs) totally no I mean I didn't buy my first mountain bike till after I finished racing so I mean I mean I am just you know I'm not a mountain biker (laughs) And, and, and I watched my daughter who's three and a half going to Kelso and I'm the one like cringing, but you know, we're letting her do it, but they're just fearless. Like it's mm-hmm. super cool. So yeah, I mean, I definitely see how starting early, <laughs> totally change yeah. your mindset about the sport is starting early. <laughs> totally change yeah. your mindset about the sport. Yeah. And because I was a total bookworm, I was super into whatever I was reading about. So when I read Nancy Drew, when I was like in second grade, I wanted to be a detective more than anything. When I started reading the Babysitter's Club books, I wanted to babysit babysitting sucks. Yeah. Like, let's be honest, yeah. babysitting's super boring. And I was still like, 
12 years old, I'm like, okay, I'm going to be a babysitter now. And I babysat. So yeah. <laughs> that's kind of why I ended up writing the Shred Girls books because I was like, man, if I'd been able to read a book when I was a kid that was like, cycling is really cool and you should do it, I probably would have been like, cycling is really cool. I should do it. <laughs> I mean, it's such a good why, right? It's amazing. Um, I'm not, I'm assuming you've, you've read the rally report. I'm just going to touch on it for a minute because I'm really curious about like your thoughts on overall, like in, in Canada, how many girls are, are being active and not. So for people who are listening who might not know what the rally report so for people who are listening who might not know what the rally report is, there's a recent report in, by Canadian Women in Sport, and it was looking encouraging action to improve sport for women and girls. And they collected from over 10,000 Canadians aged 13 to 63 and they showed that one in three Canadian, three Canadian girls drop out of sport right. during adolescence. Um, and the, it was the first study in four years, but what was unfortunate is that nothing had changed since 2016. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I mean, that's some pretty bleak data. Um, even though I see these amazing programs like Fit Spirit, um, which is so fast and female, I see what you're doing. I see more support on a national level for elite athletes. But still, those numbers about the young girls and 62% of Canadian girls are not participating in any sport. I mean, it's kind of heartbreaking. So what do you feel when you read and hear those statistics then based on what, what you're out there trying to do? Yeah, I mean, and they're the same in the U.S. I think it's by the age of like 10 to 13, it's like 87% of girls will drop out of sport, cycling in particular. And, you know, I think... It's, it's tough because I think like if a girl is athletically minded, if she wants, it's, it's tough because I think like if a girl is athletically minded, if she wants to get into sport, there are so many channels available now. You're exactly right. Like fast and female, there's really great support for elite athletes, um, mm -hmm. but there's not a whole lot of runway into like why sport is great you kind of comes in phys ed in school and you know if you're not necessarily like a team sport player there you know there there just aren't a lot of programs for you especially if your parents aren't into cycling um you know we did uh we did a little virtual launch party for the the shred girl series and i had or the new book and i had i think it was seven shred girls website come on and do interviews and you know one question was like how did you get into riding Every single one of them was like, oh, my dad rides. So he he took me mm. out. And mm -hmm. that's that's so awesome. Like, that's amazing. Yeah. That's also a problem, right? Like, that's, yes. okay, these girls are only getting into it because their their dads happen to ride. So dad kind of hung up his, his racing flats when I was born and never, like, he got back into it when I got into it. But, you know, I didn't have parents who were like, let's go out for a ride. Um, yeah. So I think that's that's kind of a big issue if you don't have someone who's gonna put you into these individual sports and you're not a team sport person it's done it's really hard to find something that suits you I think there could probably be a lot more programming that's trying to you know hit those audiences who don't necessarily want to do sport to kind of sneak them in yeah and absolutely and even in like the the school boards like I don't feel like um Absolutely. And even in like the, the school boards, like I don't feel like um, physical education is prioritized. And unfortunately, now with COVID-19, it's, it's definitely not going to be prioritized because nope. of social distancing. So this could really negatively impact these numbers. Um, and I guess like from a school perspective, the place where, you know, to really encourage participation and try and nourish that relationship with being active in sport but again, I don't feel like it's a priority where we live. I'm not speaking for every school, but of, you know, what I see in boards in Ontario. Yeah, no, I agree. I think the only plus that might come out of it can't necessarily do the team sports. They have to kind of figure out what individual sports work for them. So there might be some of those kids who wouldn't have otherwise found cycling or running or something that actually, you know, find them because they have to do a certain amount of activity and they can't do a team thing. So oh, fingers sure. crossed there's a silver lining. <laughs> I can't do a certain amount of activity and they can't do a team thing. So oh, fingers sure. crossed there's a silver lining. <laughs> I can't swear that there will be, but trying to think yeah. of one. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think there are like many, maybe not in this area, but um, so with actually COVID-19, since we're talking about it, what have you been doing to to try and what have you been doing to 
to try and create community, whether it's online or, or bridge, you know, some of that gap that from online to outside now that we're allowed a little bit more um, social interaction. Like, have you have you been able to create any like small like distanced events or how is that? I'm used to. Uh, I keep saying this is the first time in 12 years I've been in one place for more than two weeks at a time. So wow. it's been yeah. really <laughs> weird suddenly having to shift everything to virtual. And I think uh, everyone will agree when they say uh, after the first month we were all kind of in a bit of a state of Zoom fatigue. Uh, when, I, <laughs> when I first got home, it was all about like when I, when I first got home, it was all about like working with Ontario Cycling and hosting Zoom yoga classes and some some Zoom uh, courses for for girls and for young athletes and for women. Um, and then I think we all kind of needed to take a break and just get outside once the weather finally <laughs> turned nice, even though we weren't hanging out. I needed to take a break and just get outside once the weather finally <laughs> turned nice, even though we weren't hanging out together. We were all still just getting outside when we could. Um, and now yeah. it's, yeah, it's a really interesting hybrid. I've been able to, like I said, do the virtual launch for the second book in the Shred Girl series, which was really fun. And I was honestly shocked, kind of hopped on Zoom and Facebook Live and Instagram Live to hang out and do do some yoga, do a reading. My dog, kept, <laughs> my dog kept biting my nose during yoga, so it was not the most zen moment, but it was it was still great. Um, yeah. yeah, we, it, you know, it's been fun doing those events. And I, my husband Peter works with. We've been doing uh, weekly yoga sessions on Zoom, and that's been. It's actually really cool to see a bunch of like adult, you know, later in life cyclists, we'll call it, um, hopping on and, you know, turning on their video and we're all doing yoga together still. That's uh, great. So that's been really fun. And we've been able to do now more. So they have a skill session with two young girls. We're going to go shred on the mountain bike a bit. So that should be, yeah, oh, that's really great. Fun. Yeah, for sure. And do you ever find that, you know, when you have those sessions or, or even pre COVID that those girls might tell a friend that, uh, otherwise wouldn't be involved in bring them out or does it tend to stay within its own little circle of we are already bikers i think it depends on the girl i i know a lot of ones who are very extroverted and very quick to be like i'm gonna lend my friend my bike and they're gonna learn how to ride um but i will say that a lot of endurance athletes are more like me and on the introvert side of things <laughs> say that a lot of endurance athletes are more like me and on the introvert side of things <laughs> and uh, the yeah. idea of inviting someone else to to do a thing is actually like pretty scary for them so yeah we, cycling might have a problem in that most of us are fairly introverted and a little awkward to begin with so <laughs> inviting other people along along for the ride is kind of tough um, yeah I mean it's you make a good point there about like if we're if we were talking about cycling I feel like there's a bit of a barrier in that not everyone can afford the equipment right so 100%, and it's only getting worse honestly like if you look back you know Peter talks about the uh the glory days when he got into mountain biking like back in the you had you know you could go to Canadian Tire or wherever and get you know your $400 mountain bike and that was enough to start racing and you could actually race pretty well in the youth fields with that um, mm -hmm. and now, you know, if, if you're a kid riding mountain bikes, somehow you're probably on like a, you know, 1500 kid riding mountain bikes, somehow you're probably on like a, you know, $1,500 bike at least. And that, that to me is like the saddest thing because it cuts a lot of kids out of the sport before they even get started. So what if they don't want to, I mean, if you don't want to compete or even if you do, or even if you do, like, it's not like you can't, right? You can still go buy a $400 bike or a used bike that you just see on someone's front lawn. You can still go start riding your bike though. Definitely. Um, that said though, I mean, even 400 bucks, right? Like that's a lot of money yeah, for yeah, some it families. Is. It's absolutely, uh, you know, to one, um, yeah. but you know, the more and more places I go and people I talk to and stuff, I realize like there are, are so many communities where even buying that used bike is, you know, outside of people's means. And if you live in like a small apartment, like there's just, there's a lot more barriers to entry to cycling than I would have maybe thought of when I was, when I had no idea what the answer to that is. Um, yeah, no, but, for sure. I, I know there's a lot of uh, programs. I know there's um, one in Hamilton where, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but you, you literally bring any bike that you might have that you can donate to the community. 
and they collect hundreds every year, which is amazing. And then they're just given, they collect hundreds every year, which is amazing. And then they're just given to, to kids who want to get into it. Oh, that's I guess so they, cool. Yeah, I think it's great. And it, there's something called New Hope and same thing. You can donate any used um, bike material. It's in Hamilton East. And then they they do turn them around for for very cheap. And then they they do turn them around for for very cheap, like a lot cheaper than that. Mm -hmm. But if we step outside of cycling, though, I mean, there's so many, you know, you can just go kick balls and play soccer and go hiking. And, you know, being active doesn't necessarily have to mean that you're lining up with the bib number on. And I'm sure that's something lining up with the bib number on. And I'm sure that's something that you must be pushing like through shred girls and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's been funny because my entry to any cycling and sport was, was competitive. So it's been, I have to keep reminding myself like, no, people do this for fun. We can do this for fun and it's great. And I think now that I'm not transportation, it's, you know, a way to go see friends. It's a way to go explore your neighborhood. It's, you know, exactly. it's so many other things that, yeah, don't involve, like you say, pinning on a, a number. And it's, yeah, really important to remember the fun part of biking, not just the, the wattages. Yeah, I know, for sure. And I agree, like, cycling, and, and maybe I wish, you know, I had that. I, I probably did have it early on, and then I might have lost it. And now I have it back in that now it is like a, a way to commute to the grocery store. And I do do it for just to get outside versus Again, like you said, going for a group ride, you're going to hammer your head off and, you know, you're going to get mm -hmm. your watts. But yeah, it's going to hammer your head off and, you know, you're going to get mm -hmm. your watts. But yeah, it's just kind of seeing like, and, you know, even when I'm with my daughter, like, I don't care if my daughter never competes in a sport. I just want her to move, right? Mm -hmm. So we go hiking, we go hiking, and it's never like, oh, she's going to be the next Olympian. Like, it's more the mindset of let's keep girls and, and active. And that doesn't mean you ever have to race yeah exactly exactly and maybe that's you know that could be a real deterrent for a young girl to be like I don't want to line up to race yeah it's I mean it's intimidating and especially you know when you're in in these groups where you know some of the girls have been these like 10 year olds who've never been on a bike and suddenly their parents are kind of putting them into a race situation or like into one of these like more group ridey type atmospheres instead of just letting them play on bikes. So I think, yeah, we forget the element of just playing <laughs> for yeah, sure. No, absolutely. The other thing I think is, is so important about, again, absolutely. The other thing I think is, is so important about, again, uh, using the word sport might make it sound competitive, but just being active and getting out there with other people. Like to me, I think what's so important about getting girls in these, you know, sport situations is just the, you know, sport situations is just the, like the skills that bleed over from sport into everyday life. So personally, I think, okay, I always did sport and I'm convinced it's why I'm dedicated to things. I have work ethic. I like doing hard things. And I mean, sport can be very hard doing hard things. And I mean, sport can be very hard, but if you can kind of learn that, that initial frustration and agitation like leads to something good when you get really satisfied that, oh, I figured that out. Um, and then the element of teamwork and, and of course, like the improved mental health and, and body image is a toss up, improved mental health and, and body image is a toss up, right? Because it really depends on who, you know, who are you in sport with and is that coach or the person running it, you know, are they focused on function or aesthetic? So that could go both ways, but what do you think, um, like for you, how has sport, like, um, like for you, how has sport shaped you as like an entrepreneur or an athlete as far as like those values that, because you started later, actually, this is an even more interesting question. Had you started when you were really young, you might be able to say, oh, maybe that's why I did this and this, but you didn't start till you were 19. So now has it changed how you approach things? Like, have you learned different kind of skills that have translated into your life? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, it's hard to say because I mean, I think, how do I, how do I want to phrase this? I think, I think I'm almost the opposite. I would say like more of my head into sport. So 
you know, in, like, like I was saying before, like I, when I was 17, I got a job at L girl and I was going into the city and doing that while I was doing a full course load. And I was, you know, the editor in chief at my school paper and literary magazine. And I ran our poetry slams and I was a girl scout and, you know, this, that, and the other thing, um, you had, always had a very intense work ethic. Yeah, exactly. So I think when I decided to pick up sport, I, you know, it, I didn't have like a, a dial on it. I really just had a switch. Um, it's funny. I actually talked to Jen Jackson about this over the winter. We were uh, riding together in Spain and, you know, she was asking about how I got into cycling and she was like, wow, it's really weird that you actually got into it and like started doing it at the, this level with like this kind of commitment to it, like at that age and with like no athletic background and just like, just ran with it. Um, yeah. And it just like just ran with it um yeah and it's yeah it was like a switch flip like I, at no point when I decided okay I'm gonna do triathlon did I ever pause I guess like I it was a gradual progression it's not like I went out and slammed out a 20-hour training week the first week but yeah. you know when I decided I'm gonna start going to the gym and like you know working on like sitting on the spin bike and pedaling while I do, do my class reading. Like it never occurred to me to start skipping the gym. So I think yeah. Yeah, my, my work ethic from before actually like fed into like who I was as an athlete, which I mean, comes with its blessings and its curses too. You know, you know how that rabbit hole goes. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, I, this is a really interesting insight because to me, this is a really great way actually to like if you were, could talk to a young female who's thinking, oh gosh, you know, I don't belong in sport. Like I play music and I read it. Then it's like, I play music and I read it. Then it's like, hold on a second. Look at all the skill sets that you use when you play music. Like it takes dedication to show up every day to practice the guitar or the piano or to, to read those books takes you know, it, it takes focus to finish a book from start to finish instead of just earmarking it and putting a book from start to finish instead of just earmarking it and putting it back on the shelf. So you make a really interesting point that maybe um, if there are parents or, or younger girls listening, thinking, oh, that's not me, I do this and this. Well, actually, you already have a lot of the skill sets that translate really well into sport that can make you exactly oh that was such a good way of putting it I love it I'm I'm gonna steal this um <laughs> no it's it's exactly right yeah and you know I think part of the problem is with school teams and this is not every coach this is not every school team but I was helping out with a cross-country high school team and you know I was at the first practice of the season I was at the first practice of the season a couple of years ago and the first practice was like a four mile run and there were a couple of girls who showed up for the first practice and, you know, they were not runners. They got like a block down and they were panting and cramping and miserable and just like out of breath and just done. Panting and cramping and miserable and just like out of breath and just done. Um, and, you know, I, I tried to help them like ease through that first session as best I could, um, having zero coaching experience at that point and, mm -hmm. you know, trying to like... I had no idea where we were either. So I was like trying to just keep them with the other kids. Um, mm. And I think we we maybe do kids a disservice by not explaining like, hey, like, you know, this might take you a little bit longer to get to where you can run four miles. But like, could we, you know, run one, you know, run 30 seconds and walk a minute? And like, can we, you know, come at this another way where you're using this grit that you have from make a noise come out of a flute for three weeks when I first tried playing it. I, I quit the flute. That might be the only thing that I've ever <laughs> like just completely been like, nope, I'm out, not doing this. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if we kind of like show girls the like pathway to actually being good at sport and sort of explain like, no, you're time you go out. Um, I think we have this expectation that, yeah, you show up for practice, you can, you can run two miles or you can do X, Y, Z, but if we can break it down better, I think that would, that would get a lot more girls feeling more comfortable showing up. Oh, I totally agree. I mean, you know, even like my daughter's only three and a half and I'm already telling her that things are hard when you first try new things. They, mm -hmm. they probably always will be. And, you know, that's the part you just, I don't know if you, have you ever read uh, Mindset by Carol Dweck? Oh, yeah. So good. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's like so highlighted. But I mean, I, it comes back to, I mean, what she really, I mean, I, 
it comes back to, I mean, what she really bases growth mindset on was the children that actually wanted to do the activity that was hard, even if they knew that they wouldn't succeed at it. So some kids just have that, it seems, but you can, I would, kids just have that, it seems, but you can, I would say you could, you can nourish that. And I think like having coaches like you that can say, Hey, like maybe you show up and -and so-and-so has been at this for five years, or, you know, maybe they are a little more naturally talented at it, but we both know that talent isn't always going to trump it, but we both know that talent isn't always going to trump over effort. Right. So, yeah. And I mean, I think it's great to be able to show young girls, maybe even examples of athletes who, um, took 15 years to get, you know, sometimes they just see the Olympic athlete, but they don't see, and you know, it's such an Olympic athlete, but they don't see, and you know, it's such a disservice to those um, elite athletes when someone says, oh, they're so talented because mm-hmm. I think, yeah, sure. They have some talent, but talent isn't the only reason they're there. Like they put in a decade of work into that. And it's, I mean, that's so important to highlight is, oh my gosh, I mean, that's so important to highlight is, oh my gosh, that took a lot of work or that, that girl has been working hard for a long time. And I mean, I guess even that can be overwhelming, but even just to say, yeah, like you were saying, like, it's okay, that's going to be hard at first. And to have someone there to say it though, I think that's the thing, like your example is so great about you show up, ones might be celebrating. I mean, of course that's disheartening. Exactly. (laughs) <laughs> like women's road cycling in Ontario, like unless you have a circle of people around you who are very encouraging and, you know, supportive, it's actually a difficult sport to show up because there's only 20 women um, if you really will get blown off the back in time trial. So, I mean, there's a certain person that's going to keep doing that until they can keep up and whatnot. But again, like coaching is so important because think about the role that you have in that moment when that young girl like finishes her first fun race and she's either broken or or pumped depending on pace. And she's either broken or or pumped depending on, you know. (laughs) Maybe how, how they've been brought up or whatnot, but it's like that opportunity to just focus on, oh my God, like you went so hard, you tried so hard, like the effort part of it instead of, oh, you came last. Like who cares if you come last? But that's yeah. hard, right? Of course, like you would care, but it, to nourish that other side of effort, I mean, I just think that's everything. Yeah. Yeah. Could not agree more. And it's definitely interesting, even, you know, as we coach some of these camps, seeing how some of the girls, you know, respond to different rides where it's either, you know, that ride is really hard and, you know, okay, I'm getting better. Like that's helping me. It's, It's good to have hard rides or that ride was hard. Therefore I suck and I'm bad at this. Um, and you can see the different mindsets and that sounds like a dramatic example, but it honestly isn't like that's, like oh, no, genuinely how normal. yeah exactly like that's yeah. how you think like when you see it's you know not that hard for them uh, often it is very hard for them uh, I don't know how many times you've been on a group ride where like someone is chatting with you and you're like trying to pretend that you're totally fine and like chatting back and then like they turn around and you're like <gasps> oh yeah <laughs> me on most rides but <laughs> yeah uh, yeah totally it's it's been such an interesting thing to to get to work with different young women and sort of see see where their heads are at with that stuff. And you can kind of For predict sure. where they're going to be in a couple of years almost based on that. Or like you could maybe change their trajectory because you have that experience that you... Or like you could maybe change their trajectory because you have that experience that you can now be like, hey, you know what? Like I, w- I was there too and mm-hmm. this is what I did. Um, so speaking of like you coaching, is this another area where, you know, women are super underrepresented in coaching ranks mm-hmm. and in Canada, uh, 24% of head coaches of women's teams um, in Canadian universities and colleges are women. And then 18% of head coaches of mixed teams are women. And so do you think like having more female coaches can contribute to the sustainability of girls in sport or even the female coach and once in the sport, like can having a female help like with that sustainability of them staying in? 
Yeah, honestly, that stat actually seems really high. I'm like, wow, 24%, you say? That's that's awesome, uh, which just kind of shows how far we have yeah. to go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely think you know, especially in those those bigger roles, we we need more female coaches and that can be such a huge benefit. I mean, even just for girls to be able to be comfortable talking about things like their periods, like body image, you know, that kind of comfortable talking about things like their periods, like body image, you know, that kind of stuff doesn't necessarily feel super comfortable to talk to a male coach about. And this is, mm. I will add my caveat before I like go too deep on this, that I think male coaches are fantastic. I'm married to one. He does an amazing job working with women and girls. He's sometimes the conversation about female coaches ends up kind of discrediting a lot of like the good men who are doing a lot of really awesome work in the sport. So I will say there are so many fantastic male coaches out there doing great things. And I think honestly, even sometimes, especially depending on where you are in the world and what er what area you're in, I know a lot of people who will, you know, be like, oh, I would only work with a female coach on these like skills or whatever. But it's like, well, if you have like the best downhill male coach in the world right here in in our case in, in Ontario, we have, you know, the best BMX coach in the world of Brendan Arnold. And he's doing awesome things with the best BMX coach in the world of Brendan Arnold. And he's doing awesome things with the young women's uh, BMX. And mm-hmm. if you're just like, dead set that you're going to have a female coach, you might actually be doing yourself a disservice not working with Brendan Arnold. Oh, and he's an amazing human being who is so great with like kids um, and generalize on anything about that. We all all know (laughs) situations. Exactly. So that's always my like first caveat. But then my second thing is yeah, we absolutely need more female coaches. I think that would be such a a huge help. And I think we need more, I'm going to say like professionalized female coaches because there are a a number of us. um, Exactly. There's just, that's just not really, I mean, there's barely enough space for anyone to be a full-time cycling coach if we're being totally honest with it. Um, It's it's a tough career. And I think a lot of women realize that pretty early on and maybe, you know, they've gotten started in coaching and quickly saw that like the career trajectory is just not getting into a more sustainable kind of career before they, you know, rise up the ranks in coaching. So I think yeah. we need like the the higher up, like almost governmental institutional levels to make a better pathway for mm-hmm. more women to get into coaching, more women to have sustainable careers in coaching. I think that's such an important point. I mean, it's, it's one thing to say, rah, rah, let's get more women into coaching. But um, if it's not even economically, you know, it, it's not something to ignore. Like it needs to be a career. It can't just be a hobby if you want it to be sustainable. And then of course there, you know, there's the whole sustainable. And then of course there, you know, there's the whole changing of, um, I hate to call it this, but like the men's club mentality or the mm-hmm. old boys club. And there's a lot of organizations that still have that. So like you say, like there has to be someone at the top saying, okay, we need to bring more women into the sport. Otherwise it just permits itself. And yeah. yeah. And we're not bringing them in like just to add women to the roster. We're bringing them in and actually like working to get them into these like high performance like places and, you know, actually like working with them and supporting them. Um, I was on a call where they were, there was one uh, female coach for a Canadian site uh, in Europe, like people like the coaches over there would completely ignore her in favor of talking to like her assistant coach who was a male and she like, would not even recognize that she was actually the head coach. Um, and I think there's, you know, that's, that's a, maybe an extreme example, but I think that exists where you just kind of like, Oh yeah, it's, we're getting more women into coaching, but we're not this where you just kind of like, Oh yeah, it's, we're getting more women into coaching, but we're not actually gonna like focus on it or like really make sure that they're rising through the ranks and that we're developing them. So that's yeah. my soapbox. Um. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it, I think it's a super important like part of uh, bringing in, and I think it's a super important like part of uh, bringing in and keeping uh, women and girls in sport. I don't know. I just think about the comfort level of a young female, and again, they just might feel more comfortable around a female. And there's nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just sometimes you know maybe there's more expression apprehension. Yeah. yeah, about 
the coaching, I think it's, uh, I mean, there's so many amazing female athletes that I'm sure would love to be coaches, but economically, it's like, it's just not there yet, right? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I'll, I'll speak for myself and say, like, I mean, I can do some of these coaching projects and, stuff, you know, coaching on the side and everything because I have a very flexible career and that I'm a writer. And it's, yeah. it's pretty easy for me to kind of juggle the two. But, you know, I'm, I'm a very rare, per- like, there aren't that many people who can, you know, go coach a project, you know, a couple times a year and still like work their other you know, a couple times a year and still like work their other job while they're doing it um, to be able to kind of keep everything rolling. Most people, you know, would have to take vacation days from the job that actually pays their bills and they can't do that. Or, you know, they don't really want to use their vacation to coach camp, which fair enough. it's, (laughs) It's a really good point. Like it's a difficult thing to do. I used to also like coach at camps and stuff and I mean, now I can't, but same thing is because I had like another business on the side or, or I was racing or whatnot, but it's not, I mean, it's not easy. And then you throw the kids in the picture. It's mm-hmm. like, okay, like, do you have someone to care for your children for like now? Yeah. <laughs> yep. You know, there's so many factors that, that make it difficult. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's sexist because I, you know, you don't really see male coaches having that problem when they have kids. Um, I mean, s- some do. To be fair, it's not every male coach that can just like go to Spain for four weeks or anything. But I think male coaches have an easier time of weeks on projects. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to speak for anyone else because I just don't know their situation. But I get I get what you're saying. Like it's, uh, you know, it's the reality is it's still probably more. Um, that's how a lot of households are still built, um, mm-hmm. even though that's changing a lot with more women. Uh, but yeah, it's certainly it's difficult. Um, yeah. I want to kind of move back to your shred girls because I'm really curious, like when someone buys the shred girls or Allie's ride, I'm kind of curious, what do you hope that a young girl reading either? I'm really curious, like when someone buys the shred girls or Allie's ride, I'm kind of curious, what do you hope that a young girl reading either of your books leaves with as a message? Like if you had a billboard uh, that you wish they kind of closed the book and, and they, and they saw it in their mind, like, what would it say? Oh, that's, that's a good one. There's, there's almost two sides of it before I say what my actual billboard would say is because I, I wrote the series kind of thinking about it, taking two different directions. The first would be that girls who didn't ride bikes would pick it up and be like, Oh, this is super cool. I want to would pick up these books and be like, reading is actually pretty cool. Uh, And I've gotten to hear both sides of that. Um, I've gotten to hear from parents who are like, my kid would not ride bikes with me and now she will. And I've heard parents be like, my kid hated reading. And she has sat down and read this in one sitting. And every time I hear either of those stories, I'm like the happiest person. Um, Yeah, I really like, I like the second one. Like, I love the first one, of course, but I actually really like that, you know, now my, now my child is reading. It's actually really cool. I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm really just trying to make like a little tiny army of kids who are just like me, like a little, little bookworm, like a little tiny army of kids who are just like me, like a little, little bookworm (laughs) bikers. So, (laughs) but if I had to put up a billboard, um, I think really the, the biggest message is, you know, first of all, no matter who you are, there is a type of bike riding that's a bike, regardless of of who you are and what you're into. Um, and then kind mm-hmm. of similar to that point, uh, you don't have to be like everybody else in order to have a really cool community around you. Um, you know, the the three girls in the series are very, very different characters and, you know, into very different, they, you know, have their trials and tribulations as they try to figure out how to make friends with each other. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I think, you know, my, my big point with all of that was just to say like, hey, there are so many different girls who can be into bikes and you can be whichever girl you want to be. You can be the bookworm. You can be, you know, more of the girly girl. You can be whichever girl you want to be. You can be the bookworm. You can be, you know, more of the girly girl. You can be, you know, more into getting dirty on the mountain bike. You can be really into time trialing. Like you can, you can be whatever kind of 
nerdy thing fits, fits you. Uh, what's the breakfast club thing? What, like you can be a princess or a jock or... Uh, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's that's kind of the message I, I want girls to, to get that, you know, there isn't one type of cyclist and you, okay. you can be one. <laughs> That's a really great message. It's a great message for women too, right? Yeah. Like, because, you know, a lot of times women might look like that or I don't want to wear that, but it's like, no, no, no. Like anyone can get on a bike and you can wear whatever you want. Like mm-hmm. you wear whatever you're comfortable in and if you like that, then that's fine. Yeah, I think it, what a great billboard. And for kids too, as well, like not to think, oh, I have to have that look or I have to have that bike mm-hmm. um, that, that this grows and I would love to see like shred girl events just be massive in life, you know. Me <laughs> too, so, me too. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I think really. What do you have? Like, I know that COVID has changed this, but um, do you have any events coming up? How do people join? And like, what's next as far as that? The well, launch party went so well that I feel like I'm probably going to do something to that effect most months, whether it's, you know, just like a little Q&A type thing with a bunch of the other shred girls in real life that I've profiled on the website. Um, or, you know, just like a shred girls yoga session or, you know, whatever, just try to do something virtually for girls to kind of sync up. Um, it was super Mm -hmm. cool to go session or, you know, whatever, just try to do something virtually for girls to kind of sync up. Um, it was super Mm -hmm. cool just getting to see, uh, you know, some of it was just on Facebook live and Instagram live. So I couldn't see the girls, but then we did like a zoom component. So I could see like, at, you know, at one point, like I had 20 year olds on the screen, all like doing the yoga and they're all wearing like shred girls t-shirts, like doing the yoga and they're all wearing like shred girls t-shirts and stuff. And it, it was just awesome. like, the coolest thing. And I was like, Oh, cool. These are, they're from like all over the, all over North America. And it was just really rad to get them to all kind of see each other and be like, Oh, okay. Like kind of coming back to that billboard, like none of the, you know, they didn't look alike. They all rode very different but they mm-hmm. all love bikes and they all have that in common. So that was, that was really neat. Um, so I think more virtual stuff we're learning, you know, apparently it works. So that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I would love to get to have another, you know, in real life party. It obviously would be a very belated launch party, but it obviously would be a very belated launch party. But I mean, last year when Lindsay's Joyride came out, we actually did a party at Joyride 150 in Markham, Ontario. And we had, you know, like, I think with, with moms included too, we had like over a hundred people there and it was so much fun. All these little girls got to ride bikes and meet each other and eat pizza. It was so much fun. All these little girls got to ride bikes and meet each other and eat pizza and hang out. So I'd love to do that again, for sure. That's so amazing. You know what I'm thinking right now? It just came to my mind. I don't know why, but you know how you kind of mentioned sometimes it stays within the bubble of those who are already and be like if if you had all of those people that came to the launch and kind of asked them to reach out to one kid they know that doesn't exercise yeah because because it's so difficult like it, it, i keep going back to what you said earlier on about what about the child who isn't in, in the environment to see out of school And maybe they'll be taking school online, depending where they are in the world. So now they're even more removed from seeing it. So to have like, just like, I think about those kids, because I'm like, oh, how how can we, and I'm not saying every kid needs to be an athlete, but getting outside and moving is is healthy. So Mm -hmm. how to like, you know, lengthen the spider web out, how to like, you know, lengthen the spider web out to, to reach those kids who aren't in the bubble already exactly yeah Yeah. I'm thinking of your event and then I'm thinking of like little prongs from every child and parent that was there to another family that's not being active at all and how how amazing that could be to sort of like a sort of like a good version of how a virus spreads (laughs) (laughs) that's a really good one I like that Uh, yeah but exactly um actually like while we were on zoom and we were all talking after all of the girls who were you know being interviewed were saying like their dads got them into it I was like okay how many how many of the other girls because of their dads and most of the girls raised their hands and I was like okay here's your one job there's a lot of girls out there whose dads aren't into bikes they're not as cool as your dad I'm sorry to say it that way but it's true but can we invite them along for a ride and all of these yeah. little girls are like nodding their heads. And I mean, I really hope at least if even half of them did it, right? That's that, is a great, that is a great title for your next book. <laughs> <laughs> 
invite them along for the ride or something like that. I'm just yes. I'm seeing the cover now. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, that's amazing. I love that you did that. And for sure, like, of course, the dads can be cool in many other ways. But yeah. obviously, your goal is to get what you're doing. I've been loving this conversation. Um, I'm going to wrap us up. But I do want to ask you something um, kind of related because you're an entrepreneur and, you know, you you really you've gone so many different directions as so you've, you've obviously done a lot of things and completed a lot of projects done a lot of things and completed a lot of projects and maybe are working on many right now, obviously. <laughs> and the name of the, the name of the podcast is imperfect progress. And the reason I stuck with that is that I'm a huge believer that, you know, when you get want to go from a to B, no matter what your goal is, it's rarely like in a linear fa- in a linear fashion that you get there. So whether it's one step back, you know, three steps forward, for me, it's often two steps forward, four steps back, um, you know, whatever that looks like, the progress is, is rarely just perfect. So I'm curious, what is something that with everything you're doing and have done that you've learned about progress off of when you have something that you really want to see come to fruition and it's hard, it's taking it's taking you more time than you wanted. There's a couple steps back and forward. Like, have you kind of created a mental motto or mantra for yourself that uh, maybe young girls can listen to and think of or mantra for yourself that uh, maybe young girls can listen to and think about when they find themselves in that situation? Oh, that is such a good question. Um, it's, it's actually a really tough one because I... I think my tendency is to just be like, when, oh, that is such a good question. Um, it's, it's actually a really tough one because I, I think my tendency is to just be like, when something isn't going my way, how can I throw more work at it to, to make <laughs> stuff go? Um, you just have to like take a step back and like take a breath and relax because you're like cruising toward burnout, whether it's, you know, in, in sport or work or whatever. And often for me, it's all of them. Uh, when I was, uh, when I first started working with bicycling magazine, I was actually in the office. And at the same time, I'd just taken on like a different freelance. For some reason, I was like, this is definitely the summer that I'm going to train really hard to be really good at Xterra triathlon. Um, and I was, uh, you know, seeing my, I had just started dating my husband, a few, my now husband, a few months before that. So I was also trying to like commute to Canada from New Jersey and Oh wow! There were for that, so I was also trying to like commute to Canada from New Jersey, and oh wow, there were points where I would be at the bicycling office, and I just remember like curling up under my desk to sleep for like a few minutes at, during my lunch break um, wow. because I'd gotten up at like you know three in the morning to turn in three in the morning to turn in that freelance like part of the freelance project I was working on and get caught up on cyclocross magazine and then get to the pool uh you know next to the bicycling office so I could get in my swim before I had to go into work and you know I, I think I was like curled up under there just thinking like yeah this might be too much <laughs> the point where you can't just keep throwing work at stuff uh Sometimes you you need to take a step back. And I mean, you know, this like for people like us who love taking on new projects and, you know, love kind of all of the different elements of the entrepreneurial lifestyle, it can be really hard to not take on new projects because they're so <laughs> But there are points in life where, you know, sometimes it's it's not about, I don't need to be writing three new books or training for, you know, an Ironman or something like that. I could be keeping my fitness at a baseline and working on one book while I'm trying to like function with getting my puppy house trained. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe just like, yeah. 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 <laughs> so your tendency would be like throw more work. So now instead you've kind of realized, actually, let me just, slow down and yeah. maybe go for, maybe go for a bike ride and get some exactly. creative ideas on how to improve what I'm already doing. Exactly. Very cool. <laughs> That's all I'm already doing. Exactly. Very cool. 
<laughs> That's awesome. So I'm curious, where can people find you online? Because I have a sense there's probably several different places. Everywhere. Um, <laughs> the, the, the two main places are consummateathlete.com if you're an adult and shred hyphen an adult and shred hyphen girls.com if you are either the parent of a, a young shred girl or you are a young shred girl. Um, and then kind of on there, you can find links to all of my various social medias. Um, I'm probably the most active on Instagram at Molly J. Herford. You can also see a lot of puppy pictures at this point in time. Congratulations <laughs> on your puppy. Thank D-W. you. He's adorable. Yeah. He's yeah. amazing. He's- that's and awesome. you know what? He did really good for this whole hour. He's been, I, I would like to say being good next to me. He hasn't yeah. been. He has actually ripped the crap out of my carpet, but <laughs> he's been quiet. So wow. we're going to call I'm it a win. <laughs> yeah, I'm impressed. I'm impressed. <laughs> yeah, I'm impressed. I'm impressed that he's sitting there. Um, and then we can also find you on ProKit now, right? Yes. Yeah. Over on ProKit, I'm I'm posting a little more. I have it on my to do list most days to try to get something up. I'm not great with it, but I'm I'm trying. <laughs> and your podcasts are there, and they're also on Apple and. And your podcasts are there and they're also on Apple and where else could someone listen to the consummate athlete? Oh man, pretty much wherever podcasts are sold. Uh, you can listen direct, okay. directly on consummateathlete.com and uh, okay. Spotify, et cetera, et cetera. Perfect. That's great. Well, I'm super grateful for you taking the time to be through your work with female athletes in, in sport. It's important. I'm a huge believer that I guess small drops in a bucket really add up over time. So the more people like yourself we have out there getting girls into sport, I just believe that all these efforts will lead to higher participation from young females. Anyone that's listening, I mean, if you notice that um, they're not in an environment where they're maybe being exposed to being active, definitely like bring them into your circle. If anyone has like used equipment that they can share, I know that there's places and communities where we can donate um, and then try and really get more kids outside and moving, especially right now when they might really get more kids outside and moving, especially right now when they might be very screen bound. So thank you so much. I mean, I I hope to see you up in Collingwood hiking before the end of the summer. And it's been a real pleasure chatting today. Oh, yes. Thank you so much for having me on. This was really fun. Awesome. Okay. We'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Awesome. Okay. We'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Bye.